Well, hello, I am John Gear. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Science. In fact, the Ginny and Connor Searcy Dean, to be precise. Needless to say, I'm really glad that all of you could join us. Um, this is an opportunity to learn. It's also an experiment in the sense that we ourselves here in the College of Arts and Science haven't tried this technology before. So do bear with us as we, uh, we try to share what we can tell you a little bit about this flattening the curve. Um, just a couple logistics before we, before I do a brief introduction. Um, there will be time at the end for questions and you can type those questions into the questions box on the side of the panel and we'll do our best to try to address all those questions. We also have some questions that have already been submitted that will also drive some of uh, Professor Wright's presentation. Uh, for the record, this uh, seminar slash webinar will be recorded and we'll actually share it with you via email. Uh, as a way of introduction, one of the things that the college is really good at, and in fact, the broader university as well, is tackling the big issues that confront society. And of course, today with the pandemic, we have an unprecedented issue that's confronting us on so many different fronts. The college has been prepared and continues to be prepared to talk about things like climate change or evolution, immigration, citizenship, artificial intelligence, lots of these kinds of questions. And in fact, we, we launched a, what we call a Grand Challenge Initiative to try to bring faculty from different perspectives together to, to tackle these kinds of problems. And needless to say, it's something that I'm very proud of. And of course, I'm wearing my Vanderbilt outfit, hat and shirt, et cetera. The hat's partly due to the fact that even though I don't get a lot of haircuts, it's a little out of control at this moment in time. Um, as an institution that's really set up to try to solve the world's problems, we have a pretty big one in our midst. It's unprecedented, as I said, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's upended everything that we know in so many different ways. And what we're trying to do with this webinar is just to provide some additional information from one of our experts um, who can tell us something about the science of it. Because right now, what we wanna make sure is that we talk about the science and not necessarily so much right now about the politics because we've gotta make sure we get this right and we'll let the politics follow afterwards. And the college is literally filled with people who can speak to these kinds of issues. One of them is David Wright. And he's the Stevenson Professor of Chemistry. I also have the good fortune of having him on my leadership team. He is actually the Dean of Research and Graduate Education. He is a world-renowned expert in respiratory diagnostics. He has undertaken lots of different kinds of research dealing with viruses generally. Uh, he received his BS and BA from Tulane. He then went on to earn a PhD in MIT. And let me just say that one of the things I did about two or three weeks ago is I put together a newsletter about people stepping up. David has stepped up. He stepped up in regards to leading the college and trying to make sure we shut down our lab safely. He's made sure that we brought the right kinds of data to bear to share with our community. He has been absolutely magnificent in this entire time. And he's then made the time to pull together a lot of material to share with you right now, which of course is what we're all about. So I'm going to now turn it over to Professor Wright and let him talk to you about uh, this pandemic and what he can share, and then we'll move forward from there. And at this point in time, you will be grateful not to have to look at me, and I'm gonna turn it over to my friend and colleague, David Wright. It's your turn, David. Thank you, John. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, it's really fantastic to be in front of the classroom again. I'm teaching nanochemistry this semester, and my last uh, seminar, was the Thursday before spring break. So the second to last, the 27th of February. And I've really missed the 30 engineers and scientists from the college that we had in that class. It was a, one of the best classes I've had. And while we've had a lot of fun on Zoom and doing some online presentations and videos, there's nothing like quite, quite being in front of the classroom. Um, so to start today, I thought we'd talk about what this presentation is going to be and what it's not going to be. Uh, I'm a scientist, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about the science of diagnostics. We're gonna talk about uh, where the pandemic is and where it's going. We're gonna spend some time answering your questions. I am not a doctor, and uh, the discussion today is in no way, shape, or form medical advice. It's just the science that 
uh, informs our decision making. So as John said, you know, at Vanderbilt, we went from sending our students home to closing the research labs into a standby mode in four days. And on the Wednesday we shut down the labs, my mailbox began to paint with researchers across disciplines, across campus, who were ready and willing to pivot their research to new areas. And so what you see here is a list of some of the projects that people have started since the beginning of March. There are chemists and biologists working to understand how the virus functions and what makes it so dangerous. We have new approaches to drug discovery that a biophysics group who uses organ on a chip approaches are developing so that we can reduce the time it takes to test potential new antivirals, essentially skipping the whole animal model step. In my lab, we're working on new diagnostics to discover who has immunity to COVID-19 and ways to direct the resources for testing to make sure that we can find out where the virus is and where it's been. Using uh, researchers from chemistry, anthropology, and sociology, we have teams that are mapping the disease and its spread in Tennessee, the Southeast, and all over the world. And finally, with groups from medicine, health, and society, the departments of political science and sociology and anthropology, as well as psychology, we have new surveys and polls going into the field every day to understand how the virus is impacting our daily lives. So one of the things that I get asked a lot is how in the world did an inorganic chemist, that's kind of an esoteric uh, type of chemistry, become interested in malaria, spend their entire research career fighting a neglected tropical infectious disease, work in Africa, and now is designing diagnostic devices. And I have to say that the, the story, my story, is not that different than the story of many of the faculty at Vanderbilt. We have an incredible opportunity. We do an incredible job of recruiting faculty members who are interested in working on the hardest, most challenging problems that we have. And in fact, uh, when I started this project, it benefited working with people in global health, in biomedical engineering, and in anthropology. And so for the last seven years, our work has been supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we've been focused on designing new types of diagnostics that will provide point of care medical information to those people at the bottom of the healthcare pyramid. But the story I want to tell you today is how those exact same approaches are going to provide the tools we need to fight the COVID pandemic. So whenever I talk about diagnostics, I'm always uh, reminded of the words of William Offler, who is a Hopkins uh, MD and one of the founders of modern American medicine. And he said that there are three phases to treatment, diagnosis, diagnosis, and diagnosis. And what he really meant was, we can't treat what we don't know. We can only act on the information, the evidence that we can learn from a patient to prescribe the proper treatment. And if you don't think those words from 1892 are just as relevant as in 2020, look at any of the headlines in the last week. There's no doubt that the diagnostic testing problem is one of the biggest challenges we're facing in opening up the country. And it's such a challenge is because we can't make decisions based on things we don't know. This is not, I wish it were this way. This is not, I'm an egghead scientist, I think it's that way. We have to make decisions that are based on the evidence. And right now, as you can see in these headlines, even testing 100,000 people a day, it's not enough. If you had a dry, raspy cough and maybe a fever, maybe you had a college son or daughter who went to spring break in Panama City, and you called your doctor, they'd probably ask you to come in for a COVID-19 test. And you'd go in, they'd take a nasal swab, and they'd send it to a diagnostic lab. Now, these are pictures of the diagnostic labs at VUMC, and they represent state-of-the-art approaches to providing 
information for patients. They can do all of these kinds of tests, including the polymerase chain reaction test, PCR, which is the number one type of test we're using right now to, to determine if people are getting uh, or have the active COVID-19 infection. These laboratories have state-of-the-art facilities, electrical power backup, clean water, patient bioinformatics, electronic systems, so you get your results in an email or a text message, and a highly educated and dedicated staff of technicians, clinicians, researchers, and doctors, all dedicated to getting you the information you need so that you and your doctor can make the best choices for treatment. This is the diagnostic lab I walked into in rural Africa in Zambia 11 years ago. Needless to say, the equipment is not state-of-the-art. In fact, the most advanced piece of equipment in that lab is a, a light microscope, like the kind you use in high school biology. The power we have comes from the batteries in the truck, and the only clean water we have is the water we carry in in our backs. And when, uh, instead of a trained cohort of laboratory technicians, we have a truly dedicated uneducated group of community healthcare workers whose primary concern is how to make life better in their village. And so when I think about the challenges of how do you diagnose an infectious disease in these conditions, we have, we have a problem. A diagnostic test in the developing world must be simple enough that an uneducated, untrained patient can use it themselves outside a medical setting. It must not rely on electricity, can't need clean water, it cannot be stored in a refrigerator. A patient should have to wait no more than 15 minutes. And oh yes, in a perfect world, it should only cost about 25 cents. The World Health Organization calls these tests assured. And assured stands for affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment-free, and deliverable. And if you think that this sounds like the ideal diagnostic, no matter where you are, Zambia, Africa, or uh, Rutherford County, Tennessee, you're absolutely right. If we had diagnostics like this everywhere, we'd be out of the, the, the testing problem that we're in right now. So these are the standards that we use in my lab to design new diagnostics. Researchers around the world have poured all kinds of creativity and innovation into new diagnostics that meet these criteria. One approach that we use in my lab is nanotechnology to improve the sensitivity of the current tests. Now, Vanderbilt has made major investments in nanotechnology over the last two decades. We've made investments in students, academic programs, faculty. We have infrastructure at the state-of-the-art Vanderbilt Institute of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. And together, we've developed ways to use materials with exotic sounding names like carbon nanotubes or graphene sheets, gold nanoparticles, or quantum dots uh, that allow scientists to do more with less to achieve assured results because of the size and unique properties of these nanoscale materials. Now, we've all been to the doctor and had to give a sample for culture, right? The doctor says, oh, I don't know what this is. Give me a blood sample, a urine sample, a nasal wash sample, and uh, we'll grow a culture and see what grows up. And that's exactly what happens. They take your sample, they send it to the lab, they add your sample to some cells, and they see what happens. In two or three days, they look at it under a microscope and go, oh, you have a bacterial infection, a viral infection, Hopefully not a parasite, but sometimes even a parasitic infection. Two to three days. 
Now in my lab, with collaborations with Sandy Rosenthal in the chemistry department, we've used these quantum dots to shorten the time to figure out if a patient has a respiratory virus infection. And you can see their signal one hour after infection. Not 48 hours, not 72 hours, not up to two weeks. These are sort of the timeframes for current COVID-19 test results. The use of nanotechnology is one of the approaches that we have to push the boundaries of diagnostic devices to achieve the simplicity of assured tests. And we can and should use them in the development of new tests for COVID-19 today and for the next pandemic tomorrow. One of the first things that you notice when you're working in the development world is the prevalence of cell phones. These are countries that have simply leapfrogged the idea of landlines and gone straight to cell towers. While the U.S. has made exceptions to restrictions around telemedicine to fight the pandemic, countries in the developing world have been using telemedicine and SMS messaging for more than a decade to meet the needs of their patients. The last time we went to Macha in Zambia to test our most recent cell phone app, it was an app that scans, analyzes, sends to the cloud, notifies the patient and the doctor of, of a test result. What we found was it took 10 times longer to ping our server from my office down the hall at Vanderbilt than it did from in the field in Zambia. This is how those countries have worked to optimize their networks. So in Zambia, we use a telemedicine approach called test and treat. And the test and treat strategy is used to stop the seasonal spread of malaria. So in this approach, what happens is uh, somebody gets sick in the village and they uh, send a text message to the hospital. The hospital sends a testing team, a field team to that village, and they test everybody in that hut and in a 500 meter uh, circumference around that hut. They use an ultra-sensitive diagnostic device, and this tells them uh, who is sick and who needs to be treated, even those patients not showing symptoms. This approach works. In 2001, when we started in, in uh, this approach, there were almost 3,400 malaria diagnoses in the village during the rainy season. Last year, there were only 12. And in such a community-based approach, everyone works together to stop the spread of the disease. And this is exactly the approach we need to take to blunt COVID-19. We need to employ a test and quarantine version of this strategy immediately, and then move it to a test and, uh, sorry, that's my office phone going on, a test and a treat strategy when we have new therapies. Now, why is this such a problem right now? Well, the problem right now is that COVID-19 testing is a mess in this country. I'm sure you've all seen the pictures from around the country, long lines, cars parked on the side of the highway for drive-through testing. The infrastructure in some cities is just being completely swamped by uh, the need to answer questions about who has the virus. In fact, in Brooklyn three weeks ago, there were so many people wanting tests that they had to stop public testing because they couldn't follow uh, the procedures for safe social distancing. So one of the things that we developed in early March was a COVID-19 virtual screening tool. This virtual screening tool not only tells a patient whether or not they have uh, a need for a diagnostic test, but also where to go. So the way that it works is you log on to the app and you go through a self-assessment. The self-assessment evaluates your demographic risk factors, any symptoms that you might be showing, uh, social risk factors, are you wearing a mask, gloves, practicing good social distancing? Do you have any underlying symptoms or conditions? and what other exposure risk factors you may have. So we've been using uh, this information 
it goes into an algorithm, which is essentially the exact same diagnostic tree the CDC uses, and it pops out a result. Your risk is low, moderate, high, or very high. And the patient then gets additional information, particularly about where to go get a test. And so using this sort of screening app, we're able to send patients to testing locations that have capacity. So this is not just measuring whether or not somebody needs a test, but it's plugging into the healthcare infrastructure, which is one of the things that is being challenged so badly during this crisis. The last thing that this app does is it also provides information to public health departments. So we can quickly gather a local view of what's happening. We need this because as you can see, while testing has increased in the United States, it's only gone up to about 4 million tests. Well, 4 million tests, that sounds like a lot of tests. Sometimes I think I haven't even come close to doing that many tests in my entire career. But 4 million tests is less than one and a quarter percent of our population. That's not enough information to make the choices that we have to make now to open up the country. So we need these tools to address the testing crisis. So this is an overview of what we've been doing here at Vanderbilt and, and the efforts around new diagnostic approaches, public health approaches, and other things that uh, researchers are, are doing. What I wanna do now is sort of switch gears and ask questions and if you have questions, you can start typing in the question panel. Uh, some of you submitted questions ahead of time. And so I'm gonna start with those while you get comfortable thinking about uh, what other questions you might want to ask. And so the first question that comes up whenever I talk about COVID-19 is where exactly did the virus come from and how do we know? And so the truth of the matter is COVID-19 is a coronavirus. And many coronaviruses uh, have their natural home, we call it the reservoir, in bats. And so there's a high probability that this coronavirus started off as a bat virus. And you go, why is a virus like bats? Well, if you think about it, bats live in cold, cool, dark, damp environments, which are exactly the environment that makes uh, the virus um, safe and propagate easily. The, the, the bats live in packed colonies, sometimes called camps. And so um, it's easy for the virus to go from one bat to the next bat to the next bat to the next bat. And so this is why the coronavirus has evolved a natural host in bats. And so what happens is the bats bite other animals, the virus transfers from the bat to another species. In the case of uh, COVID-19, we think that it might be a pangolin. A pangolin, you can look it up on the web after we're done. A pangolin is kind of a cute cross between an anteater and an armadillo. Uh, SARS came from bats to civets. But regardless, these intermediate animals are then captured and taken to market. And so what happened was these infected animals were uh, shipped to a market in Wuhan, China, where they were uh, closely packed in with millions of people. And we had an event where the virus jumped from the animal host to the human host. And we call these sorts of transfers zoonotic transfers. And they're one of the real challenges that we face in uh, fighting pandemics. In fact, many pandemic viruses are likely the cause of zoonotic transfers. So Ebola, Marburg virus, these are, are, are viruses that we have in Africa tend to, to come from bush meat that is uh, caught by hunters and then brought to the villages. So another question that a lot of people ask is, how do we know that the virus is the same virus all over the world? And so the question is, the answer to that question is that um, 
we know that it's the same virus because we've analyzed the genome, the genetic code of the virus. And so a colleague of mine, his name is Trevor Bradford at the University of Washington, who works at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, has analyzed the complete genome of over 3,500 virus samples. And we know as a fact that the virus that we have in the United States first came from Wuhan, China. We have another outbreak that came from Italy. We have these types of things. So there's a lot of information that lets us know that it's the same virus all over the world. Um, okay, so some of the questions that people are asking, uh, are, let's see here. So Tanya has asked that she's read a lot about previously recovered patients testing positive for the virus again. What exactly does that mean? And is it a testing issue? Does it mean people are contagious for extended periods of time? And so <clears throat> there are a couple of things that we have to, to keep in mind. So most of the cases where people have tested positive after they have been declared cured is the result of the fact that the virus, even though it may be dead and destroyed, that DNA is still in your body. It circulates and it takes, you know, anywhere from three or four days to, to one or two weeks for that residual viral RNA to clear out of your body or to be destroyed. And so if you're tested any time during that period, there's a chance because the test we use is looking for that viral RNA that you could test positive, even though that you were recovered. Okay? This does not mean you're infected because you're just testing DNA that's left over from dead virus, but it does mean you could get a positive test result. Okay? Now, test that uh, 70 days is a long time, and I'm not sure what, what uh, the answer to that is, but by and large, almost every uh, patient who caught, you know, quote unquote, the virus a second time didn't catch it a second time. They were just had residual RNA. Uh, so Lisa asks about uh, the herd immunity theory in California. And uh, did the virus mutate as it traveled across the country? So let's talk about herd immunity for a second, because herd immunity is an idea that we'll hear a lot about, and there are real consequences to it. So the idea behind herd immunity is that if enough animals in a herd, citizens in a city, students at a school, were immune, then if somebody did become infected, there wouldn't be any place for the virus to go. And essentially it would die out. And herd immunity is a real thing. This is, I mean, we see this and practice it in agriculture, but it is also the basis of very effective vaccination programs. And so the measles is a very highly contagious disease and we have a very good vaccine for it. And so in the case of measles, you have to vaccinate about 90% of the population to uh, acquire herd immunity. Flu, on the other hand, is not nearly as contagious, and we need only about 40% of the population uh, to be vaccinated effectively to have good herd immunity. For COVID-19, with all the data we have right now, we would need about 70% of the population to be immune in order to achieve herd immunity. And without a vaccine, that's just simply not possible because you know, that would be the scenario where we had millions of deaths in the United States. Think about that, 70% of 300 million people had to have had the disease and you know a moderate death rate would just be unacceptable. So until we have an effective vaccine, it's hard to imagine that we'll get um, 
herd immunity. Okay, so there's another question here that asks, we've heard about several different types of tests. Which test will most likely be rolled out to test a bigger percentage of the US population? And how long do you think this may take? Um, there are a number of different types of tests, that's true. And that's been part of the problem. So when we began the COVID-19 crisis, the CDC had about 75,000 tests that we could use before um, the outbreak was spread very far across the United States. Unfortunately, there was a problem with those 75,000 tests. Uh, there was a reagent that just didn't work the way that it was designed to work. And the results, uh, the positive results were true, but the negative results, there were probably lots of false negatives. And so that meant that we didn't have the jump start we needed to fight the disease and, the spre and its spread at the very beginning. So one of the very first things the government did was that they allowed labs like mine to develop or fast track laboratory developed tests. They're called LDTs. And this is one of the reasons why there are several different kinds of tests out there. And uh, probably what we're going to see is some of those tests will just not work very effectively or relative to, to the marketplace where a big diagnostic company like Abbott can really cut the price low, we're gonna see uh, a number of tests shake out. And so I think we'll have one or two types of tests that look for the genetic material, their PCR tests, which we use to determine if somebody has an active infection. And there'll probably be five or six antibody tests all rolled out and validated in the next six weeks to three months that we will use to determine who has had the test because those people will likely have uh, immunity. Another question is asked by Taylor who wants to know if we need quick, affordable mass testing for COVID-19, what's the biggest obstacle preventing this from becoming a reality? I have to say that there are, there are a couple of problems uh, related to, to effectively launching testing. And one is there's just a lot of confusion about why we need it. And so we have mixed messages from the federal government from state governments, from local governments, and we have different testing procedures in different states. And so one of the things that people who are designing tests and trying to manufacture tests are, are having problems with is figuring out what are the rules, what are the standards, who do they have to, who do they have to report to, to get their tests into the field. And so while we've uh, fast-tracked laboratory developed tests, there's still an incredible amount of red tape in developing a new diagnostic. Um, so around diagnostic testing, the, uh, there's a question is, is the antibody or PCR test a better indicator to opening up society? And I'd like to say that I think that both tests are needed. We need to know right now because there are probably so many uninfected people in the United States. We need to know uh, who act actively has the disease. And then as time progresses, we'll need to be able to understand who, we'll need to understand better who has had the disease. And so I think that both types of tests are important and have a very specific function in determining how we're going to open up society. Uh, okay, so let's uh, sort of step away from the origins. You guys are doing great with the questions. Um, and ask a little bit more about the disease. So 
A lot of people ask me, why is this virus so much dangerous, more dangerous than other viruses or the flu? And so one of the, uh, the answers to that is sort of, we have to be very careful when we compare viruses to other types of viruses. It really is an apples and orange kind of situation. And so the reason that the COVID-19 is so much more dangerous is that it's uh, more infective and it's more, um, we call it pathogenic. It, it does more damage to the host, to the human host. And so what are these two things? Why do these two things matter? So when we talk about infectivity of a virus, we talk about its transmissibility number or reproducibility number. So you may have seen this in the press, it's called r naught, And it's a measure of how many people you would affect. So seasonal flu has an r naught of about 1.1. So that if I go into, a, into my classroom and I go uh, and I'm infected with the flu, there's a chance that I might infect 1.1 one to 1.4 other students. If I have COVID-19 and go into the classroom, I can infect three students and then they can infect three students. And they, so you can see very quickly this difference in transmission, this difference in infectivity results in huge numbers of uh, patient cases. The other thing is that this virus is a lot more aggressive. And so, um, you know, the flu can lead to pneumonia sometimes, uh, but pretty much we often clear it. The, the COVID-19 not only leads to pneumonia, but it also leads to a condition called hypoxia, where even before you get ammonia, your body's not getting enough oxygen. And so your body is working really hard already. You might not even know it before you get really sick. And so it's sort of a double whammy. The third thing that the COVID-19 virus is doing that is different than the flu is uh, it seems that in a certain population of patients, there are a lot of blood clots that are formed. And so these blood clots then get thrown off and uh, they cause stroke and other problems. And so you may have read that the Tony Award winning actor in New York had his leg amputated as a result of complications from COVID. And the complication was his body was just producing too many blood clots and the source of those blood clots were in his leg. So they amputated his leg to remove the system. Um, so people are worried about models. We seem to see a lot of them and they don't necessarily say the same thing. So what's going on there? And so I have to say that you have to keep in mind that the issue with models is that they are just models. And the models that we had at the beginning of the pandemic are different than the models that we had at the middle of the pandemic are different from the models that we have today. And so we need to, to keep that in mind. And it means that as, as citizens, as consumers of information, we need to understand what we're reading about. We need to understand when the model that people are talking about was originally developed. And so I think that this is one of the most important things that we have to keep in mind. Um, there's a couple of questions here. How do seemingly healthy young people, why do seemingly healthy young people die? I will say that this is uh, one of the mysteries of COVID-19, although uh, a series of reports out of New York where they've had a lot of cases seem to suggest that there's a, 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 a link between young people who are suffering from obesity and the severity of COVID-19. Now, we don't know exactly why, but uh, it could just be that you have to work harder, you have to work your lungs harder if uh, you're heavier, but it's a, it's a, it's a very startling uh, connection between obesity and the severity of COVID-19 in young people particularly. Um, the other question, does hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine work? 
And are there other antivirals that are being developed? I have to say, uh, I use chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine a lot in my malaria research. And if it's not drug resistant malaria, it's very effective. I'm moderately, um, what, what to say? I don't think hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine are going to prove to be very effective treatments. They might show some impact, but we're going to have much better to develop drugs that do much better to make patients healthy. And so one of those drugs that, that people are very excited about right now is remdesivir. Remdesivir is what we call a pan antiviral. It's designed to stop a whole bunch of different coronaviruses. And so uh, there's a lot of promising controlled studies that are beginning to show that remdesivir can make a big difference. Uh, okay, so I want to get to Amy's question because she sent it in yesterday. Uh, is there any commonality between the people who have had COVID-19 but have been asymptomatic, blood type, et cetera, et cetera? And I'm, I'm going to say that probably the only, the strongest similarity we see amongst the asymptomatic patients is age. They tend to be younger, healthier people who were able to, uh, their body was able to fight off the disease before they ever showed symptoms. So um, it's good to be young. This is a hard disease if uh, you're older. So I want to turn to some of the questions about uh, the impact of social distancing. And so this, this slide that shows the total coronavirus cases in the United States is a few days out of date. Uh, it's a log plot, but I think you can see that beginning March 19th or so, between March 19th and March 22nd, we really began to flatten the curve. And so social distancing, the impact of social distancing in the United States has been very effective. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one, of the, one of the ways to think about that is that if people are practicing social distancing, then it becomes a little harder, a little more difficult for that virus to go from person to person. And so what you'd expect is that the transmission number would decrease. And so what we see is that uh, on this plot on the right, that shows the transmission number in various groups of Tennessee counties, the Tennessee Highland Rim, which includes Davidson County, has a transmission factor below one. That means that if we maintain social distancing and this, the shelter at home order, that in all likelihood, the virus would, would burn itself out in Davidson County and, we, and it would just cease to exist. The problem is, is that people from some of these other areas where R is above one come into Nashville, you could have a dramatic uptick. And so this is one of the problems that we're significantly facing is that the social distancing practices that are being used very effectively across the United States are really making a difference. But if we suddenly say everything can go back to normal, we're going to see a huge spike. There's absolutely no doubt about that in my mind. Um, and so I think that, that uh, Jill, who asked, what are the dangers of going back to work before wide scale testing takes place? This, this is related to this question, you know, with social distancing is working, but if we don't know who is sick or who has been sick and we suddenly take our foot off the brakes, it's going to be uh, a, real, a real problem. Uh,
So uh, Pam asked, how long can you have the virus and not start show symptoms? Well, if you're asymptomatic, you will never show symptoms. If you're, if you're going to actually show symptoms, people are showing the symptoms about five days uh, after exposure. Um, so David asked, are autopsies pro providing much helpful data? Deaths from organ failure, lungs mostly. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that not only in the United States, but around the world, uh, the influx of the, the stress on our healthcare systems has been so high that autopsies have essentially, uh, you know, ground to a, to a halt. In fact, I have a friend who lives in Barcelona, which is a hard hit area in Spain. And in their hospitals, they don't do autopsies. When people have died, they've gone straight to cremation. And uh, the ashes, the urns are being stored in the hospital until the pandemic is, is done because they don't want people coming to the hospital to collect the remains. It's not quite that bad in, in US cities, but the doctors who would, who would normally provide autopsies are being pressed into service to actually provide patient care today. So, uh, I'm sure that as things taper down, we'll have a better idea of what autopsy information, what autopsies can tell us about the, the disease. But right now, there are just not a lot of autopsies being done. Uh... Okay, so let's talk a little bit about vaccines, antibodies, et cetera. And so one of the questions that people have asked is essentially how long until we get a vaccine? And I think that in the best case, it would be, we would, it would be a really great outcome if we had a vaccine before next summer, okay, so about a year. We might get it sooner if things were to, to break the right way, but uh, really there's going to be, uh, it's gonna be at least a year. Now I have to say that we have researchers at Vanderbilt around the world uh, who are taking the lessons they used from developing vaccines and therapies for Ebola and applying those exact same processes to COVID-19 to develop the vaccine as fast as humanly possible. Excuse me. And, and one of the ways that we have done this is through federal funding. And so there's an organization in the government called the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA. And for about the last five to 10 years, DITRA has funded a number of studies, some of them at Vanderbilt University, that were all about if there was an unknown outbreak, what are the technologies you could develop to make vaccines faster? And so we're now seeing that those basic scientific research ideas that were uh, developed around a worst case scenario a decade ago are being put into practice right now. And so, you know, I think if we have a vaccine by the beginning of next summer, it will be a, a world record in development. It will ensure the safety of patients who take it, and it's exactly what we need. Now, in the interim, one of the things that people are using is that they're taking antibodies or serum from patients who have recovered, and they're using the antibodies from patients who have recovered in patients that are, are suffering from the infection. This is a tried and true approach. I mean, even way back in some of the early pandemics in the, in the early 70s in Africa with Marburg virus, some of the people who survived survived because a group of nuns took uh, serum from survivors and injected them into people who were suffering from the hemorrhagic virus. So I think that this is, is a pretty good uh, approach, but it's a limited approach. 
So vaccines are a permanent approach. Uh, the antibodies that a patient who's, who has gotten better is a temporary solution. One of the other things that people ask is, uh, is there a chance that we will never develop a vaccine? And I have to say that I think that the, the chance to that is no. I think we will absolutely develop a vaccine. Uh, there's no reason, there's nothing special about coronavirus that makes it uh, difficult to develop, to use our approaches developing vaccines on COVID-19. So I think that's one of the things that works in our favor as we face uh, the days ahead is that we absolutely should be able to develop a vaccine. Now, the other question that people ask about vaccines is, well, are we going to have to have a new vaccine every year? Is this going to be like the flu virus, right? Because what happens in the flu virus? We all get flu shots every year. And a year before we get that shot, doctors and epidemiologists and, and virus specialists make a guess about how the virus has changed. And so we then make the vaccine, and the vaccine we get so next, next fall, when we start getting the, the flu vaccine, it's based on guesses that we're making a year ago. And we have to do that because the flu vaccine, the flu virus mutates pretty quickly. Now, in the case of COVID-19, because Trevor Bradford has had the opportunity to look at how fast these 20, 3,600 genome virus samples he's looked at, He's got a very good feel for where the mutations are happening. And it doesn't look like any of the mutations that are happening are happening where uh, antibodies bind, where a vaccine would, would target. And so that's a good sign. That means we might only have to uh, redesign the COVID-19 vaccine every three to five years. And we'd have a long time to know exactly the kinds of changes that we would make. So we'd probably even not even think about it as a new, uh, an ever-changing vaccine like the flu vaccine. We just think about it as COVID vaccine A, B, C, or D. And so that's something else that really works in our favor in developing an effective vaccine treatment. So I, I think that this is this is good. Uh, All right. Uh, okay, so one of the questions that, that people have asked based on this chart that I've shown you for Tennessee is, why is the transmission number different for different counties? <clears throat> and I think that the, uh, the, the most straightforward interpretation is that the counties that are practicing the best social distancing have the lowest transmission number. And so Davidson County, which shut down uh, bars and social gatherings essentially a week ahead of the state, and Vanderbilt shut things down a week before the city, uh, we've done a great job of practicing social distancing. And so our number is below one. Some of these other counties, where uh, they didn't go into practice until the governor declared that we should have social distancing, uh, have just not begin, begun to see the impact of social distancing the way Davidson County and the Tennessee Highland Rim has. There's one other thing that we should note, sort of particularly the purple in the Northeast, you know, one of the problems is that we just haven't done a lot of testing there. And so you see that it could be anywhere from 0.7 to 1.7. There's a lot of uncertainty in some of those numbers where we just haven't done a lot of tests. But by and large, the interpretation is where we've done good testing, people have practiced good social, social distancing, and r not has gone down. Well, um, David, I'm going to... We're getting close to the end of our time. I suspect you have many more questions, but we'll um, let you take one more. And then I've, I've been told that you'll stay around to answer some additional questions if people want to stay on. 
Um, so I will uh, let you answer one more and then I'll come back to uh, wrap it up. Okay. Um, so one of the questions uh, and concerns that people have had, uh, this is from Ginger, who has said that she's heard that reagents are in short supply. And is that true? And, I, and in the case of testing, uh, in fact, the reagents have been in short supply in some, some locations where they've had uh, really high numbers of cases. And in other, in other cases, other locations, there are plenty of reagents because social distancing was put into place before the number of cases had a chance to jump really high. I will say, uh, specifically at Vanderbilt, there's been a cr an incredible amount of cooperation between the university and the medical center in terms of making sure that first-line responders have the reagents and the PPE that they needed to do uh, their work over in the hospital. So as an example, uh, right before the outbreak, my department ordered, you know, got a big shipment of gloves. 200,000 gloves. And the chair of the chemistry department reached out to the med center to let them know that we had those gloves and we could provide a backup supply if there were any problems. But what we did was, was just a piece of it. What we've seen is that people all over the city and the area came out to provide uh, equipment, reagents, PPE, that uh, may have made sure that our first line workers in the hospital settings can do their jobs and be as safe as possible. And so uh, people often ask me, what do I think is going to take us to the end of this pandemic? And I think that uh, it's gonna be science and I think it's gonna be the golden rule. There's never been a time where it's been more important to, to treat other people with the kindness and humanity that we want to be treated with. And so this was one of the real uh, positive outcomes. We had neighbors looking into, on neighbors, people checking on, on uh, people they haven't talked to in, in years. And this is gonna make a huge difference. So that's sort of science will provide the vaccines and the tests and the tools and uh, Changing social behaviors is going to provide uh, the human part of the equation that we need to solve this problem. So thank you all very much. I'll uh, just wait a second before I start answering questions so we can say who's going to be here. Yeah, let me just uh, wrap up and obviously start with a, a huge thanks to, to David for making the time, for answering the kinds of questions, for just shedding some light on this problem that has uh, turned our world upside down. There's no other way to describe it. But as you can tell, if you've got some data, you got some smarts, and you have lots of collaborators, you can make a difference. And that's what we do at Vanderbilt every day, and David's an example of what we're trying to do. And I just thank you again for, for, uh, for joining us. You know, stay safe, be well, follow all those practices. As they say, wash your hands. Um, I don't think I've ever washed my hands so much in the last two weeks. I've probably for the last two years, maybe two decades. I don't know. But in any case, from the bottom of my heart, thank you again, David, and thank all of you for, for participating um, and being part of this uh, webinar. And I'm going to sign off, let David answer questions. Um, and as I said, stay safe and be well. And thanks again. Bye bye. Thanks, John. Um, so I can keep answering questions. I'll, I'll, I'll stay on until uh, the numbers drop. Uh, so one of the questions uh, was a request to clarify uh, did, whether or not I said, if, we, if you've had the virus and you've now recovered, you now have immunity in the future. And the answer to that question is uh, most likely you absolutely will have immunity if you've recovered. In fact, asymptomatic patients may very well have immunity uh, even more so. So I, th I think that uh, this is the whole, this is actually what 
drives the concept of herd immunity. And so once you've suffered from the disease, unless there's a major mutation in how the disease interacts with the cells, you're going to, to have immunity. Uh, okay, so prophylactic use of antibody serum is one method of preventing infection or lessening its impact. And so this is, this is what I was talking about, Carolyn, that uh, we can, can use the uh, antibody serum as, as a method to effectively uh, treat patients. There, you know, it's just, we're just limited to how much of that serum is truly available when we have the number of cases that we have in the United States. Um, so there's an interesting statistics question here as to why is the logarithmic scale more helpful in this case than a linear scale? Uh, really, the answer is that it allows us to, to see small, the impact of smaller changes more easily. So the linear, the linear scale um, also shows the flattening of the curve, but it, you don't see the beginning of that flattening very easily. So this helps visualize how uh, the impact of social distancing is translating. Another question asked, is the virus affecting the binding of oxygen to heme molecules? Uh, I don't think it's so much that the virus is, is impacting the binding of oxygen to heme molecules as that the virus is causing the lysis of red blood cells. Um, it, this is a, an area that I would say is research, being research, researched currently. We don't really have a very good idea, but many times uh, when human cells suffer disease, one of the things that goes out of whack is the balance of certain metals. And one of those metals is iron, and a source of iron is red blood cells. And so, you know, we may be seeing something here where uh, there's a lot of red blood cell lysis which is also then adding to the clotting problem. But I don't think that the virus is actually decreasing the oxygen binding capacity of hemoglobin as much as it's rupturing red blood cells and causing the hemoglobin to be degraded and uh, recycled through normal times. Um, okay, so what are the factors uh, that caused the virus to disintegrate? So this, this is a great question. And it's a great question because there's also been an incredible amount of varied information on the internet about what you should do to, to, to stop the virus, to protect yourself from the virus. Um, so without a doubt, the number one thing is to wash your hands. If you keep the virus off your hands, you're not putting your fingers in your mouth or up your nose or wiping your eyes, and you're just absolutely eliminating all the possible ways that, or many of the possible ways that the virus can get inside you. And so if you, if you practice those sorts of personal hygiene techniques, that's one of the most important things that you can do. There's also been a lot of discussion about uh, how should I treat surfaces, doorknobs, handrails, boxes that come from Amazon, my mail from the Postal Service. Okay. And what we're seeing is many of those delivery people are doing the best that they can do. They're wearing gloves, they're changing gloves often. If you go out using gloves, you know, is, is not a bad uh, practice if you're in areas where there are a lot of cases or if you're going to a grocery store where a lot of people may have touched something. So it's common sense in terms of how we should uh, think about uh, protecting ourselves from the virus. In terms of uh, sanitizers are things that, that work really well. 
you know, anything that is about 65% or higher in alcohol content will absolutely destroy this virus. And so one of the things that the chemistry department has done during the pandemic is that we have made about 3,000 gallons of uh, hand sanitizer for our housekeeping staff, ground crews, public safety people who are still on campus, uh, keeping the buildings safe and operating uh, so that they would have the opportunity to wipe things down and keep their hands as clean as possible. The other things that, that uh, damage the virus, of course, UV radiation, so sunlight. So it's good if you're outside, uh, as long as you're practicing social distancing. And so uh, these are sort of, some of the number of things that can really uh, help us practice good hygiene behaviors to stop transmissions. Uh, okay. Uh, if social distance, so so if social distancing drops off, will masks protect us? So I think that there is. Uh, I think this was also one of those great science communication stories where whether or not you should use a mask has entirely changed from the beginning of the pandemic to now. And I think that wearing a mask protects you and it protects other people. And if you're in an area that has uh, cases ongoing, wearing a mask in provision with safer at home orders is exactly what you should be doing. Uh, if social distancing drops off, will masks protect us? The answer is, uh, the short answer is it certainly will protect you more than if you do not wear a mask. Um, if social distancing drops off, I think in the United States, we will see a larger population of people continuing to wear masks and gloves after the pandemic. I think that that's just one of the, one of the ways that will, um, that America will be changed as a result. Um, hmm. Oh, okay, so here's another question. And I'll just, will warmer weather halt the virus? And I'm gonna say that the answer to that is I don't know. But most other viruses, including SARS and MERS, which are coronaviruses, their uh, impact drops off as a function of higher, warmer weather. And so I can't tell you for sure if COVID-19 is going to show the same pattern or not, but many viruses show this warm weather sensitivity. Now, what could happen is that we have um, warm weather sensitivity and so it stops in the northern hemisphere but it blows up in south america africa east asia so that by the time it starts to get cool here again in the northern hemisphere and we just have a big cycle and so um, we might get a natural lag but then we'll have more uh, people coming back uh, are there any stats as to uh, the impact on surface to person spread versus person to person spread? Uh, not really, because it's very difficult to, to determine which active cases came from contracting the disease from a person, uh, a surface rather than a person. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's far more likely that person to person spread is going to be uh, a much larger percentage of the cases of 
of contraction of the virus. That's just the way that it is. Uh, surface spread has to go through surface contact. You have to touch the exact spot of the surface where the virus, you know, it's just easier as opposed to being close to someone and you're breathing in and out of the same air or you're coughing and aerosolizing virus and things. Um, it's just harder to imagine that most of the virus that people are catching is not coming from another person as opposed to a, to a, to a, a surface. So surfaces are a potential source, but um, they're not, the, an everyday surface is not that great of source. Now, if you're going to some place like a handrail, an escalator rail, the grocery store, where there's an opportunity for a lot of people have touched a lot of things, that's a slightly different situation. And so I think in those cases, thinking about wearing gloves is a, is a great way to protect yourself. Um, okay, so Mary asked the question, in my best guess, how long do we need to maintain social distancing in order to have the virus dissipate? And there are two things that matter in my answer to that question. The first is, um, if we're at places where there's lots of virus cases, Seattle, San Francisco, New York City, Chicago, then we're gonna to have to practice social distancing for more time uh, than other places. I think that we'll be practicing social distancing in this country uh, at least through the end of May, despite what some politicians may want. And uh, in all likelihood, if we continue good social distancing, we'll see uh, things uh, remarkably improved by the end of June. But that's, that's my best guess. Um, okay, so there's questions about diagnostic tests and their reliability. And so I think the, re the reliability question is a good question. It's one of the hard questions that those of us who develop diagnostics uh, work with. And so the idea is um, if the CDC couldn't even make sure that their initial tests work, how can I trust any test? And I think that the answer to that is, is that you have to, to, to truly believe that we can solve this problem about how to design a good test. I think the test we're using for PCR right now is very good. It's very sensitive and, we're, and um, the improvements that have been made by Abbott, which is a large international uh, diagnostic company, seem to be making great improvements in the sensitivity and specificity of the PCR test. Antibody tests are gonna be uh, an entirely different kettle of fish. Antibody tests are really uh, difficult because in their simplest form, what happens is they're, you improve the specificity, so they're looking for the exact kind of antibodies we need to detect to know if somebody is sick, but the sensitivity of the test drops down. So in an antibody test, it's very difficult to have good sensitivity and good specificity. What usually happens is it's a trade-off so that you have good sensitivity, but your specificity might not be so great, or you have great specificity, but your test is less, less sensitive. And right now in the antibody tests, it tends to be specific and, and insensitive. There are things that we're doing in our lab and the other research groups are doing. Uh, and, and so um, that are designed to address that problem, but they're not going to be in some of these first generation antibody tests. So 
in terms of the antibody test, I think the first generation antibody tests will have a fair number of false negatives. False negatives will be the problem. So people will uh, actually be immune. They'll have low concentrations of the antibodies in their system and they'll test as not being exposed. So as a patient, that wouldn't hurt my feelings too much, but as a public health or global health expert, that makes it really hard for me to make my decisions. Um, so there's a question about, uh, why do we see uh, heart attacks in COVID patients in intensive care units? I think that one, um, let me ask the second question in that. And is there significant heart or tissue damage that occurs as a result of the virus? So I think that what we're seeing in most of those cases are embolisms that are being thrown as a result of clots, and that that leads to arrhythmia and heart attacks. Uh, and so I, I don't, th like I said, we haven't done a lot of the autopsies that we, we would normally do to be able to see what kind of other tissue damage is ongoing. But uh, my, I think that the heart attacks and is related, and the strokes are more related to the blood clots than a specific virus mediated type of heart attack. I don't think the virus causes heart attacks per se. Um, okay, what other questions? When, okay, so let's talk about travel. There's a lot of questions about travel. How will we know when airplane travel is safe? I think that airplane travel will be safe when we can uh, begin to lower the restrictions on social distancing. I think one of the real questions that airlines are gonna be faced with is what is the trade-off from flying half empty flights where they practice good social distancing versus not flying at all or flying by packing us all into the cattle cars again and taking to the skies. I think that I'm hoping that people working with the airline industry as part of the CARES Recovery Act are planning for sort of a phased approach uh, to flying. And then it will be up to the airlines to decide what makes economically feasible sense. But I think that we can begin to think about flying, certainly domestically, once we have uh, ideas about the prevalence of the disease. The other thing is, is that there will probably continue to be hot spots, even when 80% of the country might be ready to, to go back to the new normal. But, you know, so people will have to make decisions about where they travel, not only based on where they want to go, but on what is the continuing prevalence of the disease. And so I think those will be things that will change how we travel. Uh, the question is, when will it be safe to travel internationally again? That is a question that is... Uh, a little more complicated to answer because of course we have no control over what people in other countries are doing or not doing. Uh, I will tell you that right now uh, Vanderbilt University is following the State Department and CDC regulations with regards to traveling internationally and so we basically have a travel ban before uh, we move to a travel ban we base it on the Center for Disease Control a number system. So if a country was four or three CDC number, that means that there's a significant public health problem in that location and the recommendation is not to fly or not to travel there. That's pretty common sense uh, procedures to follow. The State Department has a separate uh, system for evaluating the threats in international locations for our citizens to travel. The 
State Department numbers are also very good, but they include political unrest. And so CDC is where you want to look towards getting information that's just about diseases. The State Department sort of takes a, a picture of everybody. I think that it's going to be really hard to travel internationally over the summer. I have to say my family was going on a family trip to, to investigate our roots in Sweden and we canceled it. I just got my refund back from British Airs yesterday. Um, I know other people that are canceling their trips internationally as well. Um, so I think that it's gonna be pretty tough to travel internationally uh, before the fall at the earliest. Let's see. Hey, David. Yeah. So this is actually all the time that we have, but thank you okay. so much for all of our attendees and I'll let you close it out. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time and your attention and the opportunity to be in front of a class again one more time before the end of the semester. Thanks a lot, everybody.